Okay, thank you everyone for joining. So today we have our speaker is Marcelo Aqueros. And um, he actually grew up in, in New York, and that's where he also did his bachelor in Columbia University. Uh, and then he came to, to Europe, uh, to the UK, and where he did a uh, master in physics. And then he moved back to the United States and did a PhD at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, all the way at the West Coast. And after that, he went um, back to the East Coast, back to Columbia University to do a postdoc. And from there, one thing led to the other, and now he has a fixed staff position at this university. And his uh, expertise is, uh, well, he's his love, actually. He's mainly, mainly low mass stars, and that's what also his uh, talk of today will be about. So please, Marcel, you have the floor. Thank you. You can hear me OK? OK, I'm not echoing too much. All right. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I uh, uh, thank you, yours. Thank you for the for uh, the introduction, and thank you for uh, spending time with me today. I um, I actually have been here before, but it was a really long time ago. It was uh, 1989, and I was in high school. And I think there was a Model UN, and we came we came to to live in for that. And I don't really remember a whole lot else about that experience. Um, but so it's nice to be back. Whatever that is, I'm not going to do the math. 30 years later, to tell you about uh, work that uh, that my group and I have been doing to understand the properties of low mass stars. And so, what I'm talking about here are stars on the main sequence, um, mass of the sun, and less massive. And um, before I say anything else about about them, I just want to introduce you to my my group. This is uh, from our group meeting last week. So I'm currently uh, living in, in France. I'm on sabbatical at the Université de Bordeaux. So our, our group meetings are on Zoom. Um, and I have, I have a couple of longtime uh, research scientists in my group, postdocs Jason Curtis and Alejandro Nunez. Uh, and then Matt just graduated from undergraduate at Columbia in the School of Engineering. Uh, Peter is a retired uh, anesthesiologist, pediatric anesthesiologist, who's been working in our group for several years. And everybody else here is a current undergraduate, um, either at Columbia or at Barnard College, which is our, our, the women's school associated. So anyway, the, the, I don't have time to show you all of the projects that we're working on, but, uh, but I, I wanted to spend a little time uh, introducing you to, to them because uh, they, uh, they make my day-to-day -day work really a lot of fun. OK, so um, let me tell you a little bit about the motivation for what we do, if they, it's not going to work. Interesting. Hmm. Why won't it go forward? That's strange. Ah, here we go. OK, so uh, this is a plot I pulled off of the Exoplanet Archive um, a couple of days ago. And it just shows the evolution of our knowledge of uh, the population of exoplanets in the Milky Way. And um, this is a reminder of how quickly things have changed in a fairly short period of time. So I was an undergraduate in the mid-1990s. And at that time, it was still possible to have arguments about whether or not there were planets outside of the solar system. Uh, that argument is obviously over now. <laughs> and uh, here, what I've indicated, this is a cumulative plot. So it shows you the, the number of exoplanets discovered as a function of time. Here's uh, the Kepler mission, which launched in about 2009. And you can see like the the number of planets that we know of has, has grown tremendously since Kepler uh, launched. Here is the sort of the follow-on at some level to Kepler, the, the test mission launched in 2018. And both of these missions work by uh, looking for, uh, sorry, I'm highlighting the wrong thing, transits, right, where the planet passes in front of a star, and you measure the, that change in the brightness of the star to detect the planet. And so if I had to sort of summarize the, the state, how the state of knowledge has evolved in that, that period of time, I would say we now know there are planets everywhere. And in fact, um, on average, we think there is an exoplanet for every star in the Milky Way. So the questions now obviously become more sophisticated because we've answered the basic statistical question, if you will, like how common are, are exoplanets, how many of them do you think there are? And so we can ask things that are more complicated, like how many of these planets are actually habitable? Now, habitability is actually a fairly complicated concept. 
And so I'm not going to go into all of the aspects of this, but I, I'm going to focus on two aspects for the purposes of this talk. The first is uh, whether the planet is uh, at what you might consider the right distance from its parent star. And so this is the idea that on Earth, water, uh, liquid water is crucial to the emergence of, of life as we know it. And so what we would like to do is, in order to, to find habitable planets, find, is to find Earth-like planets that are at the right distance from their parent star to have liquid water on the surface. So that's what this, this illustration is intended to convey. If you're too close in, of course, you're too hot, and you, you just boil off the, the surface water. If you're too far out, you're too cold, and you have an ice world, right? And so there's a, there's a place in the middle between those where you can uh, have liquid water. So if you ask, OK, well, how are we doing in terms of finding planets in this part of their systems, the answer is actually we're doing very well. So for example, there's a, there's a very famous example that we owe to uh, some of our colleagues here in Belgium, which is the TRAPPIST-1 system. This is a system that has seven exoplanets that are you know, something like the Earth's size. They're larger, really, but they're kind of Earth-like. And depending on exactly who you ask, three or four of those are in the habitable zone of the parent star. So they could potentially carry uh, liquid water on the surface. Okay, so the answer to this question seems to be um, from the perspective of being in the habitable zone, quite a few. There's another aspect to habitability, though, which is maybe not quite as appreciated, um, and that is the age of the planet. So this is an artist impression of uh, the Hedean period. Uh, this is, Hedean comes from Hades, right, which is hell. Uh, this is the very early Earth. Uh, this is not a scientific illustration. I don't know why the Daily Mail, I didn't actually bother reading the article. I just like the, the graphic. Uh, this is the first 100 million years of the Earth's evolution, and so there are lots of things that are going on at this point. You still have a molten crust, right? The, the crust hasn't completely cooled yet. Uh, there's lots and lots of volcanism. Um, there, this is the, corresponds to the late heavy bombardment period in the solar system's evolution, so there are lots of things flying around and smacking into you. The sun is very close by. I, this I don't know why they illustrate it this way, but, but anyway, this I think is not, you know, this is not a very pleasant, livable planet, right? Uh, by contrast, of course, uh, today, well, not, not exactly today. I, I walked through here, this, it didn't quite look like this today, but, uh, you know, today we have a habitable planet, at least, at least for now. And uh, the difference, of course, between these two images is just time. Right? So, uh, four billion years ago, the Earth was not very uh, conducive to having life on it. Uh, today, uh, it is. And so when we find these exoplanets in the habitable zones of stars, a natural question to ask is, how old are they? Okay. Now, it turns out that that's not an easy question to answer. Um, for the vast majority, all of the exoplanets discovered to date, uh, and probably for the, for the foreseeable future, we're not really going to be able to directly answer that question. And so what people have done is they've sort of displaced the question and said, we know that planets form at the same time as stars, the stars that they orbit, and so if we can um, uh, find the age of the star, then we'll be able to say what the age of the planet is, right? And we can use that as, uh, to help us understand the evolutionary state of the planet. So that sounds good in theory, um, but in practice, there's only one star for which we have a precise and accurate age, and that is the sun. Uh, and um, one thing I like to do here, since we have, a, we have an audience, um, I'm going to ask, how do we know the age of the sun? Let's give everyone a second to think about it. Perfect. Yeah, so it usually takes people quite a while to, to realize that it's not from the sun itself. Right? The sun itself is not a very good indicator of how old it is. Uh, so people then often think about it. Earth rocks, earth rocks are on average pretty young because the earth is geologically active. So then they'll say, no, maybe the moon. The moon has older rocks, but it's not the most 
uh, the, the best handle we have. The best handle we have does indeed come from meteorites, and specifically from these things, I'd have been even more impressed if you'd said carbonaceous chondrites. I'm impressed, but, right? Those are these little inclusions in this. This is a meteorite from the American Museum of Natural History, and this corresponds to unprocessed material from the very, very early days of the solar system. And so I hopefully don't have to convince you that this is not an approach that is generalizable to other planetary systems, right? So the question becomes, um, can we find proxies to determine the ages of stars uh, observationally from, from the information that we have? And fortunately, um, people realized a long time ago already that there are, there should be at least, observational proxies that allow you to tell how old the star is. And that's because stars, uh, like most people, certainly like me, uh, slow down as they age. Uh, they're born relatively uh, rapidly spinning, uh, relatively magnetically active, and as they get older, uh, they lose some of their angular momentum, so their spin rates decrease. This is through uh, magnetized winds. That, that acts as a torque on the star and results in a weaker dynamo. And so they also get magnetically less active. And so you can see you have this nice feedback loop that suggests that maybe those are the kinds of observables that you could look at to tell you how old the star is. So this is not a new idea, as I was saying. This is something that was realized, I don't know exactly when, but certainly there was a lot of work on this that was done observationally in the 1950s and 1960s. And it was summarized in this very famous plot from a two-page paper in 1972 by Andy Skumanich, and what I'd like you to focus on here for now is that middle, this middle line here. So the x-axis here is time, the age of the star in billions of years, so here's a billion years, and what we're focusing on here is the rotational speed of the star. So later in this talk, I'll be talking about the rotational period. Uh, here we're talking about the rotational speed. And what you see is that uh, young stars rotate quickly, and then uh, it looks like they decay smoothly with time. So this is fantastic because this is exactly the kind of relation that you would uh, then be able to use when you observe a star, you measure its rotation speed, and you can use this relation to tell you exactly how old it is. Okay. So there are a few things to, to point out about this. Uh, this, by the way, this, the, form, the, the form of this is known as the Skumanich Law, uh, and the relationship is that the rotation rate goes as one over the age. So it has this, this uh, excuse me, one over the, the square root of the h. So it has this nice functional form. Um, so there are a few things, few things I want to say uh, before moving on from this. Um, the first is that, like, like many things in astronomy, it relies on quite the leap of faith, uh, given the data that were available at the time. So you'll notice this is actually a relation based on three points. Okay? Those three points are two very well-known open clusters, the Pleiades and the Hyades. And then the third point is actually the sun. Right. And so that encompasses five or five billion years <laughs> right there of stellar evolution. Um, and uh, Skumanich himself was attuned to the fact that one of the basic issues you could have with this is that this relies on how well you think you know the ages, in particular of the Pleiades and the Hyades in this case. Uh, and so that's what this arrow is intended to indicate which is that it's, he has the Hyades at about 400 million years. We now think it's more like 700 million years. And in 1972, he was saying, well, if the Hyades is not here, but it's over here, you're obviously going to have to change the shape of the relation. And just for reference, the Pleiades here is less than 100 million years, and we now think it's more like 120. Okay, so that's already an issue with this, which is that you have to have good calibrations in order to, to really know this relation well. The second issue, uh, which is much more relevant to, to my uh, to my day to day work, is that this was done really for solar type stars. So really, they were focusing on stars that are the mass of, of the sun. Um, and all of the work that we're doing now, or at least most of it, in trying to find exoplanets and uh, identify um, identify Earth like habitable exoplanets is really focusing on much lower mass stars, things like K and M dwarfs, which are just some fraction of the mass of the sun. So for example, TRAPPIST-1, the parent star in that system of seven stars, is only about 10% the mass of the sun. And so the, the question is, you know, what happens if you do that for these very low mass stars? And of course, in 1972, no one had ever seen 
a 0.1 solar mass star, so th that wasn't even relevant to the discussion then, but it is very relevant to the discussion now. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip ahead now by about 45 years to, to give you a sense of what, what we're doing now to, to uh, understand a bit better the rotational evolution specifically for these lower mass stars. And um, what I'm going to start with is actually uh, what happened when Kepler died. So the Kepler mission uh, was pointed at one piece of the sky for four years. From, from my perspective, that was incredibly boring. And the best thing it ever did was die. Because when it died, they, in order to continue to use the satellite, they had to reimagine re the mission. And it was then uh, set up so that it could observe along the ecliptic. Okay, and this was because it was using solar pressure to, to replace one of the stabilizers that it had lost. Along the ecliptic, there are lots and lots of open clusters. Famous ones like the Pleiades and uh, the Hyades, and in fact, another one that I've worked on quite a bit called Persepi. Um, this is the, also known as the Beehive Cluster. It's in the constellation of Cancer. And um, this is just showing you the K2. So Kepler was rebaptized uh, K2. This is showing you the, the K2 field of view with the members of the cluster uh, overlaid. And essentially what this meant was we were now in, a, in an era of uh, industrial light curve production. So it would take, you know, would have taken an individual astronomer at a single telescope uh, an infinite amount of time to do. Now it could be done in one pointing of, of the K2 uh, telescope. And so, um, in 2017, we, f we published a first paper just based on this single campaign where we more or less doubled the number of rotation periods that had been accumulated over decades for, for Persepi. And then in 2021, Reina Vampali, who's shown here, is now a graduate student at Dartmouth, um, used the fact that um, uh, K2 had actually gone back to Persepi three times in three years uh, to not only add to those rotation periods so that we now have over 1,000 in this single cluster, uh, but also to look at things like the persistence of spots on the surface of the, the star. And if you're interested, I can tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, a thousand periods. So she, peer she published a paper with a thousand periods for Persepi. And 13 years ago, I, I published a paper with 40 periods for Persepi, and I thought that was a big deal. Okay. All right, so things changed. All right, so what do, what do the data look like? So this is, this is a plot from that 2021 point paper. This is actually the same thing, plotted twice. So this is the, the Gaia uh, color here. You can see the equivalent uh, spectral type along the top here. And the, the difference between these two uh, is that on the left, we're including all the stars. And on the right, we're including only things that we think are single stars. And the y-axis is the rotation period in days. So the Skimanich plot, things that were high were fast rotators because we were looking at the spin rate. Here, things that are high are slow rotators because they have long periods. Okay? Uh, and so what you see when you, when you do this, when you look at an ensemble of stars, is, is kind of this characteristic behavior where there's a, 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 a rapid increase here in the, or sorry, decrease in the rotation rate as you go to, to cooler stars. And then there's this kind of steady uh, dec decline in the, in the period, so there's like, it's a nice uh, slope here. We have, we have our little nicknames for these various pieces. And then this is what sometimes called the waterfall, where you reach um, the early M dwarfs here, and now you start to see again this wide distribution in rotation periods. So this part here is kind of the part that I want you to focus on for now, because it has this very nice uh, single-valued uh, relationship between the color of the star, its age, and the rate at which it's rotating, right? So this is, this is exactly what um, you would hope for, right, as you're trying to build up this picture. I'll just say one more thing quickly here. So why do we remove the binaries? Uh, we remove the binaries because, as you know, binaries, especially close ones, can have lots and lots of interactions. Those can change the evolution of the, the individual components. And so if you really want to understand how things are uh, ev evolving in a single star context, you kind of have to take them out and study them separately. Because they're not, not going to follow the same patterns, necessarily. Okay, so now what's interesting, of course, is you can do this for ensembles of stars, and you can trace how rotation is changing with time. 
Right? And so that's what I'm going to walk you through here is just what, what you see if we look at this in populations of different ages. Persepi, for reference, is about 700 million years old. Okay? So it's a, little, it's a little older than the Hyades. Um, this is from Louisa Rebel's 2016 paper on the Pleiades. So now uh, color has been replaced by effective temperature. Right? It's the same thing. Here's the, uh, here's the spectral type. And so you can see, like, in a, in a younger cluster, 120 million years, um, you do have that, that single star sequence, but there's also, it's maybe a little noisier. There are still some more rapid rotators. And, um, and then if you move from there to Persepi, what you see is that the whole population seems to have moved up, right? Which is, again, based on the picture that I was giving you earlier, what you expect. The stars are getting older, their rotation should be slowing down. Uh, and what you can do, uh, you can do lots of different things here. Let's see. I, I, know I can't see ahead, so what did I do next? Oh, yes, that's what I did next. Um, so one of the things that we've done is ask, okay, well, so if I take this sequence, right, that goes from the F stars through the, the M stars, and I assume I fit that with some polynomial, and I just ask, how does that slow down over time? Can I predict uh, where stars should be in the future, right? And, and so we did that as a very basic test to see what would happen at the age of the sun. And what you see here is that, in fact, our projected stellar population, so we're taking this population and we're just applying a standard uh, spin down to it. So in the same way that the Skumanich law has that one over square root of age dependence, we're doing the same thing here. And then you get this yellow line. And what you see is it goes right through the sun. Okay? And so what this is saying is that if you're focused on solar type stars, um, the Skumanish description actually works pretty well. So the, the difference in age here is something like a factor of nine, and the difference in rotation is something like a factor of three. Okay? So that's great. But as I told you before, that's not the part that really is driving our current investigations. Our current investigations are really focused on this part of the diagram, where things are very cool. And what we realized a few years ago, uh, and this had been kind of hinted at before in the literature, so I don't want to suggest that we were the first, but we, we certainly have brought it back to people's attention, is that the situation as you go to cooler stars is not as straightforward. Uh, so this is from a 2018 paper where I was actually looking at a couple of older clusters than Persepi, so trying to map out this evolution as we go towards the sun's age. And this, this, these data were taken by Kepler, so there were some open clusters in the Kepler field. This one is NGC 6811, it's about a billion years old. And it was studied by CERN, Maybaum, and some of his colleagues back in 2011. They published a number of rotation periods for stars in that cluster. And so I just plotted them with Persepi because I was curious to see where they fit. And what you can see is that as you're, if you're looking at the G2 stars, you know, they are slowing down. It's about 300 million years, so there's some, some spin down happening. But as you go to the cooler stars, they start to overlap with this sequence. And what Jason did uh, a year later was now absolutely uh, nail this case. And that was, what he did was say, you know, back in 2011, they didn't have Gaia, so they didn't really know the membership of 6811 that well. Now, with, with Gaia, we can actually go and establish with great confidence the membership of the cluster down into the early M stars. 6811 is far, so you can't really do it much beyond that. And we can use the Kepler data. We still have access to the Kepler data, so we can get the light curves for those very same stars and measure their rotation periods. And what you see very clearly now is that as you go to the K stars and into the early Ms, they are overlapping with Persepi. And this is just reinforced by this orange line, which is that Persepi polynomial spun down to the age of NGC 6811. So it says the sun-like stars are doing what you expect. The K stars are not. So just to, just to recap, what this is saying is that somehow these 300 year, this 300 million year age difference doesn't seem to be impacting the uh, rotation rate of these older stars. Um, a year, year later, we extend this to, to some even older clusters, and um, if anything, this just showed that the problem is even worse. Um, so now the orange and the, and, the, and the blue here are still NGC 6811 and Persepi. We've added a 1.5 uh, billion year cluster here, NGC 752, 
And here, the blue corresponds to nearly 3 billion year old cluster, Ruprecht 147. And you can see all of these dots are sort of compressed into this very same area of this diagram. Whereas if you took Presepi and evolved it to 3 billion years, you would expect an, M, an early M star to be rotating with a period of you know, between 30 and 40 days. In fact, it's down here at between 10 and 20 days. So these stars are lying to us about how old they are. It's a very Hollywood thing to do. Now this has very clear implications for using rotation as a proxy for how old the star is. Because if you just use the standard kind of projection of how slowly they should be spinning, you're going to get this very wrong. Okay. Why is this happening? I don't have the slightest idea. Okay. And it's something we're trying to figure out right now um, by looking at more clusters at other ages uh, to try and understand when is the onset of this process? Uh, when does this stalling happen? Uh, when does it restart? We know that um, M stars in the field have rotation periods as long as 100 days. So at some point, they must decide to start spinning down again. Um, there are lots of interesting questions here that we're still very much exploring. But I'm going to switch gears now and tell you a little bit about, uh, first of all, how Gaia has completely changed our uh, the possibilities for what we can do in Cantu, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing now with, with what we've gotten from Gaia. So uh, when we were doing this a few years ago, one of the basic problems is that um, you're limited in terms of the number of clusters that you can study in this way. Uh, the clusters that people study classically are ones that are really well known, like the ones I showed you from the Skumanj plot, the Pleiades, the Hyades, Presepi, that you know, have been around since antiquity and probably even before. Okay? And nature just hasn't given us that many open clusters that are nearby, uh, and, that, and then the ones that are nearby tend to be very young. So you don't necessarily have a great range of laboratories. So Gaia changed things in two ways. And I, I've already sort of hinted at one of those ways, but I want to just illustrate this a little bit more. So this is from a set of visualizations that were produced by Stephen Mangast, who I think is a postdoc in Vienna. And essentially what he wanted to show was how, with Gaia data, you could really transform your view, even of these clusters that you thought you knew. Okay? And so this is a series of well-known, well-studied clusters. Here's the Pleiades, for example, uh, here in green. Uh, and what he's showing here is the, the Kantat Godin. So this is kind of the, the archetypal. This was the first real Gaia catalog, redone catalogs for these clusters, where they fed the positions of these clusters into uh, the Gaia database, and they constructed new membership catalogs for them. And kind of like the example I showed you for NGC 6811, they're able to push those membership catalogs into much light mass stars. Um, this is just a side view so you can get a sense of what these look like. Now, what, what uh, MindGuest et all did is they started looking for extended structures around these uh, uh, clusters, and so just that's the first impact of Gaia is that you start to see that these things are way bigger than you'd imagined initially, right? And then what Marina Kunkel and Kevin Covey did uh, in a paper in 2019 is an even larger scale search where now they're not actually inputting the positions of known clusters and looking for things around that in some defined volume. They're just saying, find me everything that's associated. And look at the scale change here. Okay. So, our ability to study even the things that we thought we knew well has been completely changed by this, right? Because suddenly there are way more targets in these individual clusters than there were before. But the second thing that Kunkel and Kobe did specifically is that by unleashing their algorithm on all of the Gaia data, they found structures that no one knew the existence of before, right? These are all things that were in catalogs before. Um, this is the picture of our uh, neighborhood within a kiloparsec now from the Kunkel and Covey Association. So we're right here in the middle. These dots are things that you know we would identify as open cluster-like, so you know spherical, nice and, and orderly. But look at all these string-like and filamentary things that are stretching all over the place here. And these are color-coded by age. So now we just have this wealth of co-moving uh, populations. Um, that are, you know, we think coeval, at least hopefully, 
at a wide range of ages that we can try and study in the way that we had been doing for a long time with the, with the, the well-known catalog. So that's what we've been doing. Uh, and in order to do this, we launched, we launched this, uh, this survey a couple of years ago. Uh, that's the, the acronym is MARMIT. Keep, you know, there you go. Uh, and it stands for Membership, Abundances, Rotation, Magnetism over Time. The idea is that we first, we really focus in on the membership of these things in order to be sure that we're, we're looking at things that are real uh, and characterize these structures, you know, get better ages and so on uh, for them. And then we want to do everything we can with them. So study the rotation in the way that I've already described, look at elemental abundances, uh, try to understand how magnetic activity, which is the flip side of rotation, um, uh, how that's behaving, uh, and then do this in, in on these objects of different ages so that we can examine how this works over time. Uh, I'm a little disappointed I didn't get a better reaction because this, this is like my finest effort, this acronym. I mean, I'm really proud of this acronym. <sighs> Tough crowd. Okay, so, uh, so I'm just going to tell you a couple of stories here. That's, that's all I really have time for. And they're not, they're not finished stories because this is really describing the work that we're doing today. Um, but I want to give you a sense of how transformative this has been. So this is uh, from a paper in 2003. These are color magnitude diagrams of these structures that were found by a Brazilian, I, I think he's an amateur astronomer named Bruno Alessi, and, uh, in the southern sky. And he was saying, you know, I, looking at these things, I think these are, these are clusters. And I just want to focus on uh, this panel here. This is so-called Alessi 9, and this is the, the, uh, the color magnitude diagram. And so uh, here you see the isochrone fit, and this is based essentially on 20 stars. So through a combination of, of star counts and color magnitude cuts and so on and so forth, uh, Alessi and, and his collaborators said, we think there is a 250 million year old cluster here. Okay, um, so that's what it looked like in 2003. Um, this is what it looks like today. Uh, so this is uh, work that Peter Rothstein is, is leading. Uh, so this is the RA deck picture for, for the same cluster. Here are the Cantat Godin members that, that uh, really focus in on the, on the core of the structure. You can see the, the Kunkel and Covey structure extends way, way beyond that. Has this, call it like the bat cluster, we, we thought. Um, but it spans something like 40 degrees and it has close to 2,000 members in this, in this view. Um, if, you, if you show this in um, galactic coordinates, by the way, it stops having this weird structure. This is partially projection effects. So one of the first things we did was we actually looked at the rotation periods across this cluster. So we used the TESS satellite to get light curves for, for cluster stars um, uh, from as much of it as we can. And the idea here is that um, if this is a real structure, then the rotation periods should demonstrate something like the kinds of patterns I was showing you before. If it's a bunch of unassociated stars, then you wouldn't expect to see that kind of structure, right? And indeed, we did see the kind of structure we expected, um, and so that um, uh, reinforced our conviction that this thing is, is real. So this is what a, an updated um, color magnitude diagram looks like for the cluster. Uh, here. The green dots just indicate that we're focused really on those core members, so things that were in the Alessi, uh, excuse me, in the Cantat Godin catalog. And if you're interested, I can tell you a little bit more about why those catalogs so different, look so different. Uh, and, um, and so we've set this isochron, and we get an age of about 300 million years for the structure. The inset just shows you how, how the, the fit changes if you change the, the reddening in the direction of the cluster. And so the point is that you know, we have a lot and much better data than they did in 2003, but actually the age estimate that we get is not terribly different than the one that they got based on those 20 stars, which is kind of amazing. Uh, and so this paper now, what we're, what we're working on is just uh, putting out this complete characterization of this cluster, um, you know, using the membership catalog, the rotation, the color magnitude diagram to say, hey, we have now a population of 300 million years where we can pursue these kinds of studies. Uh, this, I should say, is not an age that is well sampled in the kinds of clusters that we had before. Okay, so that's one story. The second story, and the last one that I'll tell you today, um, is uh, kind of goes back to this planet motivation that I gave you in the beginning. Um, so this is a cartoon of the position of two Kepler-hosting stars, 
Kepler-52 and Kepler-968. They were discovered in the original uh, Kepler observations. Uh, each of these uh, stars uh, is a K-dwarf and hosts three planets. And when they were found, uh, you know, they were treated like other planets in the Kepler uh, field. So people tried to uh, find uh, the age of the host stars. And one of these stars, I think, was claimed to be 2 billion years, plus or minus 1.5 billion years old, roughly. Uh, not the, er the errors are quite symmetric. And this one, I think, was 6 billion years, plus or minus 4. Okay, so spanning the age of the, you know, the universe, more or less. Um, which is not unusual, by the way. So uh, TRAPPIST-1, the age estimates are from, I want to say, from 5 to 10 billion years. Okay, so these age estimates are not terrible, terribly accurate. So what Jason found when he went back and cross-matched all of the Kepler hosting stars to these Theia structures, these are, by the way, I, for, I think I forgot to mention this, but this is with the name that uh, Kunkel and Covey gave to the, the uh, structures that they were finding when they built their catalog. So they have a Theia number. Uh, is that they actually belonged to Theia 520. Okay. And so this is fantastic because it gives us an opportunity to really nail down the properties of these stars much better, and in particular their ages. Um, so this is work that uh, Boaz, uh, shown here, an undergrad in my group, has been working on. And so I just wanted to show you, for example, you know, this is another case where this looks a little strange in this kind of RA and DEC uh, projection, but if you put it into galactic coordinates, you see something a lot more centrally concentrated and these, and these, this kind of tail here. Um, and here what we're showing is that we can use the, the, the Gaia RVs to construct these kind of uh, 3D kinematics and you find that there is some contamination. So these red dots are things that we think are not members and they are predominantly, well, they tend to be more in the tails, but you see that there are actually members out here in these tails. So again, even though these structures look very extended, um, these stars do seem to be associated. Uh, and I should say we, we looked at the rotation periods and you get, again, an internally consistent set of rotation periods for, for this. Um, so here's the, here's the isochrone fit for the stars in the core. Here are the two planet hosts, which are now the same age. So they can't be two and six billion years old. And in fact, they are more like 430 million years old. Uh, which makes them, uh, makes these six planets among the youngest uh, planets for which we have an accurate age. And so in that sense, uh, and that, by the way, is right at the end of the Hidean. So that is that first picture I showed you. It is the difference between that first picture and the picture today, you know, would be 400 million to 6 billion years. Okay, and so the last thing I want to mention um, is uh, abundances, um, because, uh, because this, is, this is kind of fun and new for me. Uh, one thing I said is that we want to look at abundances. And one abundance that's particularly interesting to people is lithium, because as you know, lithium is created in the Big Bang and then it's destroyed from that point on in stars. Uh, and this is a well-established fact, of course, but there isn't a huge number of clusters for which this kind of has been measured. So we don't entirely know the rate at which lithium is depleted in these stars. Uh, and so this is a plot showing the data for two uh, of our favorite clusters that I've mentioned several times already, the Pleiades in the dark blue, Persepi in the orange. Uh, and so what you see, this is the equivalent width of lithium versus the... Um, the effective temperature. So the strength of the equivalent width tells you something about the abundance of the lithium. The Pleiades have lots of lithium. They're younger. And Persepi, at every temperature, has less lithium. It's older. And what you see is that it's not super clean, but 520 seems to lie between the two, which is entirely consistent with the idea that it's a few hundred million years old. It's older than the Pleiades, but younger than Persepi. And so the point is um, that uh, things like Theia 520 and these other uh, Theia structures, um, these revised catalogs for the open clusters that we already knew about but really didn't know particularly, like LSE 9, are going to allow us to calibrate these kinds of age-dependent relations much better than we were able to before. All right, so that is, uh, that's, my, that's my talk. Um, I was trying to figure out how to conclude, and so I did what everybody is doing these days. I uh, went and asked ChatGPT. 
uh, what are some good reasons to study low mass stars in open clusters? Uh, and it gave me uh, what I think is a, a reasonable list of responses here. So I'll leave you with that, and I'll take questions you might have. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Marcel. It was a really interesting talk. Are there any questions or comments or feedback? Ah, oh, the professor always takes the mic first. No matter where you go no, in the no, world. No, that's not true, that's not true, <laughs> but I have just a question. <laughs> so in your clusters for yeah. Gaia, they, the clusters are very big. Mm -hmm. So they are... So what, what is the criterion to use that a member is still a member? Yeah, it's a very good question. So um, there is not one single criterion, as you can imagine. Um, we don't have full 3D kinematics for everything. And so, so we, have to, we have to make some decisions. Um, what I will say, I mean, so, you know, we use the, the usual thing, some combination of parallax, proper motion. If we have the RVs, then we can do the full velocities, and we can use those as criteria to, to decide what's a member, what's not. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and I don't know the answer. Um, I don't, you know, the dynamics, the internal dynamics of these things is very complicated. I mean, I think one of the things that, that certainly this puts into, this picture uh, puts into question is exactly how do you get something that looks like this at these ages? If they really were born at the same time, um, you know, it, it, it's a challenge to star formation. That's, that's not necessarily my problem. You know, my problem is to say, what can I do with them, <laughs> right? Like, can I convince myself that this is a real structure. And what I will say is that, you know, we see that there's contamination for sure, right? Like the, the way that this is, this is um, defined, um, you're going to get some fraction of the stars in one of these structures are, are contaminants. But it's at the 20% level maybe, which is totally what you, you know, it's totally reasonable. Um, now, not everything we've looked at looks as convincing as the examples that I've shown you, so we're focusing really on the ones that we think are, are the most, most interesting. Any more questions? So, I'm, I'm curious about the spin-down plots you were showing. Sure. Essentially, you show, the way, the way I understand it, you construct these lines towards different ages just by using a, a unique time scale for spin-down? Right. Is it the just as Cumanix? Uh, it's a value? yeah. It's a slightly different. Um, it's a slightly different uh, exponent, but essentially it's a it's a Cumanix spin down. And okay. and clearly, what this is telling us is you can't do that. Okay. There, there has to be some some mass term. Uh, yeah. That so, changes the time scale. So yeah, I'm I'm wondering more from the theory perspective because mm -hmm. all of this is really sensitive to a lot of things physics-wise. So you care about the mass loss rates, you care about the, how magnetism goes with rotation. Mm -hmm. So if anything, I would expect this not to scale with a, a single power. Mm. So I would find it surprising if it is like that across the masses. And it feels like it is across a wide range of masses. So I'm curious, theory-wise, what do people say? What do, do people expect? Does is there any serious attempt to try to model this from first principles? Um, there, there are serious attempts. Yes, I, I think the people who try this are serious about <laughs> it. Uh, the, uh, I mean, it's a very hard problem for all the reasons that you, 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 just, uh, you just evoked. I mean, what people typically do, um, I mean, it depends really on the, on the, on the model, so I'm not going to try and, and speak generally. The, the model that I'm probably most familiar with because I work with him pretty closely, is Sean Matz. And what Sean does is he assumes that the, the stars are solid body rotators, and then really what they focus on is the torque that you apply to the star. And that is going to be based on some extrapolation from the solar wind. And, you know, there are all kinds of issues with that, but the reality was that until a few years ago, when we started to add all the, the data for these low-mass stars, right, that worked very well. Right, because you can see, like the relation here actually goes into the early case, and so the the models I have plots here, but I won't try pulling all of them up. The models did a, a decent job of of you know they were all based on the sun, so they were calibrated to make this work for the sun, um, and they did a, a decent job of replicating what was happening even to stars that were a little bit less massive than the sun. 
Um, it's really because the, the time scales for the spin down are clearly so different once you get to the late Ks and early Ms that now you're starting to see that there's a real problem with this. Mm -hmm. But if you want to try to do this from first principles, I say have at it because you know the more people work on this, the better. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if you, I mean, if we think this is all magnetic breaking and magnetic breaking is failing towards the right side of this picture, um, would you say it's something more or less with the dynamo process or maybe the wind mass loss rates change dramatically? Yeah, so, so I think there are two basic schools. Um, that I can imagine right now, right? And one, one is, is that somehow the, the efficiency of the, the, uh, the mass loss is, is uh, reduced somehow. The problem with that, though, is that then it has to pick up again, right? Because these stars eventually will be rotating at 50, 100 days or so on. So you have to have some, some mechanism that explains that, you know, maybe the topology of the magnetic field, we know the sun's, uh, uh, wind is not, you know, spherically symmetric and changes over time. So, so it's not impossible to think of this, but you have to figure out some way to make that work. The other uh, proposal that I've seen um, is, you know, in these stars you have a solid body rotating core and a convective envelope, and um, those decouple. So maybe you recouple them somehow. So you have this new injection of. Uh, of angular momentum that's coming from the core, essentially, and that offsets what you lose uh, from the winds. Now, to me, that feels a little tricky because it seems very, like, tuned to solve your problem, and I know I'm always a little bit uh, concerned when, when the, the, the answer is, is so perfectly, you know, adjusted to the problem I have. But those are essentially the two kind of places where people have, have tried to tried to explain this. For now, what I would say is that people have been more interested in trying to see if they can get um, their models to just follow this behavior and then see what that implies for the underlying physics. OK, thanks. Yep. Thank you for the question. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering the, what is actually the method used in determining these rotation periods, mm -hmm. and what kind of uncertainties um, do you get when you, well, I'm assuming it's not all uncertainties what you see on the, on the right-hand side, but I'm just yeah. wondering if there is a significant effect of that. Yeah, um, both, both excellent questions. Yeah, so the, the approach we use is, is pretty standard um, Lomskargle period finding uh, approach. So we extract the light curves. Um, from, you know, depends, the, the, the methods are slightly different for the different, um, for the different missions, and then uh, we run them through some, some Lomskargle algorithm that identifies the most likely, likely period for, uh, for that given signal. Uh, and, then, and then you have to spend a fair amount of time deciding uh, what the believability threshold is, right? Because the thing about Lomskargle is it'll find a period for everything. Um, so there's a little bit of work that goes into that. What I will say is that from, from space in particular, the, the game is very different because the light curves are almost continuous, uh, and so uh, it's not that hard to do the validation by eye. It's a lot, it's a lot harder when you have data from the ground and you, know, you, you have bad nights and whatever. Um, so that, that's that. Uh, as far as the uncertainties goes, um, there is a formal way to calculate an uncertainty on a, on a uh, Lomskargle period. Uh, I don't remember what it is. So in, in, but in my experience, you know, if you sort of calibrate different methods against each other or different measurements, what you find is that um, the agreement is usually around 10%. So that's the number in my head. Okay. It's, not, it's not a factor of two. Not systematically. Thank you. Any other questions? So, with the, the lithium seven, do I understand correctly that you basically say the older, the the more recent the star has been formed, the less lithium is in there? Uh, no, the opposite. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I couldn't really. Okay. Yeah, it's it's this is flipped relative to the other things. So in the in the in the rotation diagrams, the young things are at the bottom and the old things are at the top. Mm -hmm. In lithium, the young things are at the top and the old things are at the bottom. 
Okay, so you would assume a certain production of lithium-7 somewhere. Uh, well, in the Big Bang. But here, really, this is just empirical. This is just based on the, on the abundance you measure when you, when you look at the, the strength of the, the absorption feature. Yeah, because you mentioned that lithium gets destroyed over time, so that yes. would be counterintuitive then, if you say that the younger cluster has more lithium. The, so the younger cluster has more lithium. Oh, you mean, uh, right. So I should say lithium gets destroyed over time in stars. So if you assume that the background abundance of lithium is constant, then a younger population still has all of that lithium. Ah, okay. Yeah. Because the stars, so what happens is that the lithium is in the, in the envelopes of these stars, right? And so the early, the younger stars look lithium rich. The older stars, they have time for, for diffusion and convection and whatever to take that lithium towards the interior where it quickly reaches temperatures where it can be destroyed. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I'm sorry that wasn't clear. No other questions? I think we can end here and thank Marcel again. Thank you very much. Thank you.